Okay, well, good. Well, welcome everyone. We have a, a, a nice opportunity to spend an hour with you talking about uh, what I think is still the most difficult situation in cataract surgery, and that is zonulopathy, because we have issues with doing the, the surgery and also issues with fixating the lens. Uh, so I'm uh, really happy to have a, a stellar faculty. Uh, we're going to go a little bit uh, out of order because Dr. McCabe uh, has to uh, leave, and uh, she's actually at another uh, meeting. So we're first going to talk about issues with IOL fixation, and then we're going to end with uh, issues just with the cataract surgery itself. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kathy McCabe from uh, Florida in the United States. Uh, she is uh, one of the top uh, surgeons uh, for cataract in our country. She has some really innovative uh, 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 techniques for IOL fixation without uh, the capsular bag. So uh, we'll introduce Kathy to speak first. All right, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'm very excited to share some of the things uh, that I think are helpful in trying to deal with these complicated cases, uh, as David said. So we're gonna move right into this. And let's see, these are my affiliations and my disclosures, none of them are really relevant. So in the bag dislocations are increasing in numbers for a lot of reasons, pseudo exfoliation, prior surgery, especially vitrectomies, axial myopia, eye rubbing, and that's my father-in-law rubbing his eye right there, trauma, capsular phimosis, especially in conditions like retinitis pigmentosa and complicated initial primary cataract surgery. And there are lots of different ways that we have for fixating these IO wells. You can use 9-O-proline, but we're worried that maybe the suture will fail over time. Often you exchange those IOLs. However, there's risk of uh, damage to either the structures inside the eye, the iris, or even loss of the lens in the posterior chamber. They often require a vitrectomy and a secondary IOL must be secured in some fashion. Or there's intrascleral haptic fixation. We're gonna talk just a little bit about that. The Yamani technique, which has been really helpful uh, for many of our cases, and that involves using a special lens. Typically, we like to use the CT Lucia lens. It actually has these uh, PVDF um, haptics, which are resistant to crimping and breakage. Using a 30 gauge TSK thin walled needle, we can make a scleral tunnel two millimeters posterior to the limbus and engage the haptics within that, withdrawing them and using handheld low temperature cautery to create a flange, which is then buried into the sclera. So it's kind of a minimally invasive way. We don't have to take down conjunctiva, which is really nice. This is actually Brandon Ayer's uh, video. It's a very nice demonstration of putting in that lens, the CT Lucia lens, after he's already removed another IOL and done an anterior vitrectomy. You can see he's placed some marks on the conjunctiva, two millimeters posterior to the limbus, and then two millimeters of a tunnel, which he is now creating with that 30 gauge TSK needle, partial thickness scleral pass, turning when he reaches that two millimeter mark and entering into the posterior chamber visualizing the bevel of the needle through a very small pupil in this case and using intraocular microforceps to grasp the haptic, the leading haptic, and introduce it into the bevel, into the needle. And sometimes you do want to try this ahead of time. There can be some variability in these needles. You want to make sure that the haptic does fit into the needle and repeating the same thing for the trailing haptic, remembering the orientation that you need to be so that you're following the orientation of the haptic. You can see that you know, in this case, you want to be clockwise of those two millimeter marks to make your tunnel to initiate that. And then once you visualize the uh, bevel of the needle in the pupil, you can introduce the trailing haptic and then externalize those creating phalanges that are with low temperature cautery that will be buried and placed into sclera. So here's that. One of the tip, uh, tips and tricks of this is just don't make the flange too large doesn't really need to be large. You do want to make sure it's fully buried into superficial sclera. And by making a smaller flange, that's easier to accomplish. These can be trimmed a little bit if you need to in order to get good centration. But you can see that, you know, really didn't need to make very many large uh, conjunctival incisions, no large incision to get the lens in there either. And the case proceeds very routinely. So I made one small modification of this. I like to actually put in the haptic, the leading haptic by uh, using the inserter. It's actually a little more stable in my hands. Clearly I don't have three hands. So I do have my 
assistant advancing the plunger slowly. And then I get it all the way into the needle bevel by using intraocular graspers. The trailing haptic is always the one that's a little bit more tricky. Uh, but once you get that into the needle, I do like to externalize them simultaneously. You can do them sequentially or simultaneously. The bigger thing is to make sure you not externalize the first haptic. I find that it's a little bit easier if it's still docked within the needle, you have a little bit more maneuverability for that trailing haptic. Making small phalanges and then burying those into superficial sclera. Again, that's a really important step. So there are times though that you don't want to exchange the IOL. So maybe it was a premium IOL, multifocal or an extended depth of focus and the patient really did super well with it when they had their lens initially. These lenses can sometimes be difficult to remove, especially like a plate haptic lens or a PMMA lens. Maybe you don't want to exchange it for that reason. You'd have to make a large incision. You want to avoid disturbing conjunctiva. So I've done a lot of uh, this new uh, technique that I'll show you with post-trabeculectomy or post-Zen patients where they're really functioning well with their glaucoma procedure and you don't want to have to do anything that would disrupt that or very scarred or thin conjunctiva after previous surgery. It allows you to avoid an anterior vitrectomy in most, but not all patients. And so patients who have a retinal history, maybe that's a nice thing as well. This is what it looks like schematically. We're going to take a piece of 6.0 proline or 5.0. I prefer 6.0 now um, and place it through conjunctiva and sclera around the haptic, through the capsular bag, back out through the sulcus, and then create phalanges that are buried into superficial sclera, much like the Yamani technique. So here's a case where you can see that it's a single piece acrylic lens that's been subluxated and it's an in, in the bag subluxation. So, you know, if we're not fixating it in the eye, we're gonna take everything out, including the, the bag. And I've bent a 30 gauge TSK needle marked two millimeters posterior to the limbus, placed it through conjunctiva and sclera, and I'm using an intraocular microforceps to go behind the haptic through the capsular bag. And I'm using that forcep to help with that. I'm going to grasp a previously placed 6-0 proline suture in the inter chamber cut at a bevel. So it's easier to introduce into the bevel of the needle up as far as it'll go, which it'll go up to the bend that I placed in that needle. I like to put it all the way up because the worst thing to do is withdraw that needle and there's no suture in there. Now I'm making a really large flange and I'm making that because I call that a safety flange. I just don't wanna pull it through accidentally if I catch that. I'm gonna inflate the sulcus with viscoelastic, which I'm doing there and use the cannula to push back the IOL and capsular bag so that I'm going in front of it. In this case, taking the, the other end of the cut suture, also cut at a bevel and placing it into the lumen of the needle withdrawing that. And now I, I essentially have a belt loop or a loop of the 6-0 proline that goes around the haptic through the capsular bag. And I can use that to cinch it up uh, and pro provide the proper centration and support for that area that was loose. And I'm again putting another little safety large uh, flange there because I'm going to now address the opposite side. Sometimes there are cases where I had one just recently where the lens was just dislocated on one side into the iris and only one uh, belt loop may be necessary. But in most cases, I find that it's a little more secure to put one in 180 degrees away. So I've marked that previously. I've placed this second or I guess third at this point needle through the conjunctiva and sclera behind the haptic again, confirming that by looking with intraocular forceps, this pupil is becoming very small. And I'm going through the capsular bag and placing that previously placed 6-0 proline suture, a second piece of suture uh, with, that was cut at a bevel into the lumen of the needle, pushing it as far as it'll go until it reaches the bend. And then I'll externalize that as well. And now I place the second needle on this side, anterior to that and in the sulcus, anterior to the capsular bag complex taking the other end of the 6.0 proline and externalizing that, creating a belt loop on this other side, 180 degrees away. And now the, the part of the surgery that's a little bit uh, of finesse is making sure that you've externalized enough of the suture that there's light tension on the haptics. You don't wanna bend them straight, but light tension that supports the haptic on either side in a way that centers the lens very well. Now I'm creating just a small flange, one that will easily uh, embed into the superficial sclera, doesn't have as much risk of erosion 
I really want to make sure it's nice and flat and buried in there so that there isn't that increased risk of endophthalmitis, which has been reported with flange techniques, even the Yamani technique in the past. So that's my primary safety concern as I'm doing this step. And then it's here just cutting and trimming and watching and making sure that there's really good centration. And these are very, very stable lenses uh, once all of that is done. So I'm gonna move on so that we can talk about what we use for this technique, which is 6 proline. Doesn't matter the needle it's on, I'm not using the needles. 30 gauge TSK, that's that thin wall 30 gauge needle, low temperature handheld cautery, intraocular forceps are very helpful. It's appropriate for just about any lens design. I've done it with all of these lens designs multiple times with or without a CTR. CTR is helpful. It gives you something else to belt loop if you need to. Um, and it, it, like I said, it avoids an anterior vitrectomy in many of these cases. There are a lot of YouTube videos that I've placed. So if you need to look at other lenses or if that's helpful, there are, there's access to that. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. These are the references. Super. Kathy, thank you very much. Uh, one quick question. If you uh, have a single piece and you do have a CTR, um, do you just go for the CTR? Or do you still try to get the haptic uh, in your belt loop? I try to get the haptic as well, but it just gives another thing that's very, very secure in there to belt loop as well. So I think that, you know, the more, the more structures within that, that IOL bag complex, that you're engaging, the more stable it will be over time. It's just an additional added support. All right, super. And then uh, just for the audience, uh, how far apart do the two needle entries need to be? You said you start two millimeters back. Uh, is there a, a set distance that you uh, feel is minimally necessary? Yeah, I generally try to go about a half a millimeter and you know that would make it at two and one and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus. Because there's some, you know, sometimes you're not exactly sure where the anatomical limbus is. I now mark two millimeters posterior and then go right behind my mark and right in front of my mark. All right, perfect, great. Um, that that was uh, that was awesome. And uh, oh, I guess one last thing: Would you any pearls for if it's a dislocated toric IOL? Yeah. So you, you know. Preserve? I have had that situation a couple of times and they happen to be patients that had trabeculectomy. So with the trabecul a trabeculectomy, I was trying to avoid the bleb. Fortunately, the axis of the toric was not where the bleb was, or I would have exchanged that, that case. But you wanna know exactly what axis you're shooting for and mark that preoperatively with the patient sitting up so you can do your best to you know, replicate where the lens originally was. Perfect. Great. Well, uh, thank you. That was a stunning uh, a presentation, a great technique. Uh, I know you uh, have to go and uh, very soon. So thanks for joining <laughs> us. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, well, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Mypal Sashdev speak uh, next uh, because it's on the same topic of uh, what, IOL fixation in the uh, presence of zonulopathy, absence of uh, normal capsular fixation. Uh, he is the uh, immediate uh, past president of the All India Ophthalmology Society and uh, truly an expert in this topic. Uh, and so he's gonna talk about uh, this generally, but also specifically with the glued IOL. So my Paul, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And after the fantastic uh, presentation by Kathy, I'll be talking and taking things forward. Uh, so uh, are my slides visible? Are my slides we, visible? We, we can see them. We can yeah, see okay. them. Thank you. So I'll be talking about the IOL options that are available in the absence of posterior capsular support. So you uh, uh, would wish to kind of consider the situations where you have a, a PCR during surgery or if it has been coming to you as a secondary uh, a procedure that you need to do. Now, what exactly are the surgical options that are available? One of the surgical options that we started with was the Kelman multiflex uh, anterior chamber IOL. 
And then these are, uh, in India, this is often being practiced still, and that is the IS fixated IULs. And there are two types, whether with the sutures or without the sutures. And this is going to be my main talk, and that is the scleral fixated IULs, uh, which could be sutured or sutureless. Uh, so when you're looking at an AC IOL, again, an AC IOL was done after an intracap extraction. Often it can be done in the absence, uh, only in the presence of iris support. But however, we have to understand that the lens is in a non-physiological position and it carries the burden of multiple corneal angle and, com and iris complications, though and a peripheral iridectomy is mandatory, though some authors have said that the chances of endothelial cell loss are less because of the angulation. However, the uh, Kelman multiplex uh, IOL is not remained as popular as it was earlier. Now, let us look at the second place where you can place the IOL in the absence of capsular support, and that is the iris fixated, and these can be sutured, which has been described by Dr. Haripriya Arvind, where the haptics of the lens are sutured uh, behind the iris. Or uh, the uh, Dr. Daljeet Singh uh, uh, worst lens, which was there, which was the iris clip lens, that is used for uh, a support. And this is therefore mandatory that we have an iris support However, complications like iridodialysis and secondary pigment dispersion, et cetera, can happen. And the advantage here is that you are not disturbing the conjunctiva. And like uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker had talked about, uh, if there is a, a trap, bleb, et cetera, then you can still go in. So when you're looking at an iris clip lens, you can have a pre-pupillary or a retro-pupillary fixation. And I'll just show you that this is a... Uh, 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 iris clip lens and normally they are PMML lenses so you need a larger incision that you have and uh, this has been put uh, uh, in and then uh, what you are you need to do is that uh, the lens has to be uh, adhered or enclavated so what you have to do in these particular cases is to put pilocarpine uh, so once you have pilocarpine in you can see the pu uh, pupil going down and then you hold uh, the lens with the grabber and you can uh, use this uh, enclavation uh, uh, instrument by which you can enclavate uh, the iris and you can have into the uh, the grabber that you have the hooks that you have on the iris clip lens and this is the pretty much uh, the surgery and there's a peripheral iridectomy that is required in this particular case also now let's go on to the technique which is the scleral fixated which could be sutured or sutureless and if you look at the suture technique, this is the Morcher uh, lens, which is uh, the anredic lens. And you can see this was the old technique where you had these eyelets. And through these eyelets, you pass these sutures. I'll just uh, kind of run through a little faster. So you can see that these sutures are passed uh, across the eyelet. And then you have uh, a large incision because this anredic lens is uh, obviously uh, having a large body and you need to, in this PMMA lens, uh, have a large enough incision. And now you can see that we slowly put this in and the, uh, you have to uh, uh, take out a suture, the needle, and you have to uh, tie it. And that will be, you can see here, and that will be how you suture the lens. But again, uh, suture related complications and problems have led to the reduction of uh, this technique. Uh, you had the uh, Gabor Sharia tunnel that was described, and then we had the glued IOL, which I'll be concentrating, and then the Yamane technique, etc. In the glued IOL, you are actually not bringing it out to the conjunctiva, the haptics, but you are creating scleral fla uh, uh, flaps, which are created one to 1.5 millimeters behind. You can see this is like a trap flap, and you make the IOL go through this uh, incision and you use an MST 23 gauge forceps through which you catch the haptics, put in the second one and again grab the second haptic. And what you have to do is then you need a needle uh, and you make a tunnel. And into this tunnel, you will put in the haptic and the haptic can be placed on both the sides and then glue is applied uh, and uh, the uh, flap is closed and that is why you get what is known as a glued haptic. What the glue does is not actually hold the lens. The lens is held into the tunnel, but it creates a single complex. And this glue disappears over four to six weeks. But uh, this, uh, this complex that is made 
uh, it prevents the movement of the lens backward, forwards, or sideways, and that is what is very, very important. The scleral pocket is the most important thing for holding the intraocular lens. So just to show you schematically, this is how it is. You can uh, make this before you enter the eye, preferably, and then you can uh, have the flaps, and then the lens is going in, MST forceps, and you will pull it out, uh, as you can see here, and uh, here again, uh, before uh, the second, uh, you grasp it again, you can have a two-handed technique, you could do a single-handed technique, uh, go in with a needle uh, and then put in the lens, uh, uh, the haptic of the lens, and then apply the um, two parts of the glue. And that is the completion of the, uh, the, the surgery. This is a case of a Marfan syndrome. So you can see that there's a huge uh, luxation that is there. And obviously, it's going to be very, very difficult. And since it's a progressive zonulopathy, uh, we will prefer to do a young patient. So we'll prefer to do a, a lensectomy in this particular case. So you can see the flap has been made and the lensectomy is being done. Uh, and once the lensectomy has been done from this particular flap, uh, you can see that uh, we will go ahead and push in the intraocular lens. Uh, the haptic is being grasped, and you can see that we are pushing in the lens. Uh, you could use an injector system, but uh, this is slightly more controlled. And then once the haptic is out, your assistant holds it. Uh, and uh, Beko has described that you can use the studs of the iris clip. Uh, to hold it if you don't have an assistant. Again, you can see this is a 26 gauge needle. You are making uh, uh, the scleral pocket or the tunnel that is there. And then you will put in the uh, haptic as you can see here. And you tighten the haptic or you pull the haptic uh, so that you have a well-centered lens. And uh, after you are applying the glue, you can see that uh, you have uh, a good centered intraocular lens as you can see. Now, this is a case where uh, there was an anterior chamber lens, uh, pseudophagic always better to make the, uh, the uh, scleral flaps first so that you are on a tight globe. Uh, this is the tunnel that you are creating in this particular case. Uh, and uh, go ahead, uh, this is an open sky. This is the Kelman multiplex lens that was put earlier. And again, uh, you can go in, uh, pull, pull out the uh, one of the haptics, Again, you can uh, uh, see that it is a very controlled surgery, MST forceps, pulling out the haptic. And all I wanted to show in this particular case was that you can combine it with the penetrating keratoplasty. And again, you are pushing in the haptic and you complete your PK, uh, as you can see in this particular case. This is the preoperative and you can see the postoperative pictures with a visual recovery of 624. Now, this is a lens uh, operated in Singapore, vision finger count. Uh, fundus showed gross CME, and this was a, a tripod lens which has been put to one of the pods uh, in the above the iris and the other two below. You can see in this particular case. So what we are doing in this case again is that we are expanding this lens uh, first, and once you have expanded this lens, uh, you can uh, again have the same situation of a glued IOL. You can see a wonderfully centered glued IOL, and I'll just show you that what this has done, the good glued IOL, that the CMA, which was so extensive, has gone down significantly and the vision has improved significantly. Uh, so these are a couple of cases that I showed you. What are the complications that we can have? You can have trauma to the iris, iridodialysis, hyphema on the anterior, if it is anterior uh, to posterior, you can at times get vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, PMMA haptic may break on externalization, so ideal to use a three-piece or a proline haptic if you have it. Uh, since there is uh, the uh, haptic coming out, so normally you don't get secondary glaucoma, but there is post-op hypotony which tends to settle down over time, and the pressures normally uh, remain in the range of, uh, to begin with, 6, 8, then 12, 14, etc. CME has been described. You could have subluxation of the lens if it is not properly put, it, put into the scleral uh, pocket. And retinal detachment has been uh, shown, and there is a haptic extrusion in which we have had in two cases. Uh, so you go back and make a new tunnel and put the haptic into the new tunnel. This is there. So to sum up, I wish to say that glued IOL in complicated situation is a new innovation which was described by Amar Agarwal uh, almost more than a decade ago. Uh, and this is the use of fibrin glow for IOL implantation in the absence of capillary su support. Uh, we have found it to be safe, stable, uh, and normally there is no IOL tilt. Uh, there is faster surgical time as you don't use any sutures and there are no separate IOLs required. 
Uh, you could use this technique even for multifocal intraocular lenses, on analytic lenses. Long-term results are being evaluated by several authors, and I think it has become a popular technique like the Yamanez or the Gabar Shariat technique, uh, where you can, without using sutures, do a good fixation of the uh, IUL. So this is uh, what I wanted to sh uh, share as regards uh, the absence of capsular support and how you can manage that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That was a beautiful presentation, <clears throat> very clear in terms of uh, that. Uh, maybe I could ask uh, Dr. Asaf, uh, you know, the, um, I know that uh, scleral fixation of the uh, lens is very appealing because uh, of the security, but there is a learning curve with these. And for many surgeons, they just don't have uh, enough experience. They're not a referring uh, a referral source, uh, what if they are most comfortable with an anterior chamber IOL or a iris clip uh, IOL? Uh, is there anything wrong? Is there any reason not to, to do those procedures if that's what they're most comfortable with? Dr. Uh, Asaf? I do believe, yes, uh, I do believe that the uh, Yamani technique is very appealing uh, for the surgeon to learn. In my hands, I believe it's easier compared to the glue dial technique. There is no special glue and only one microforceps is required. The only issue is the needle and the lens. The needle, uh, you should use the 30 gauge needle as described by McCarthy, but uh, uh, we, uh, in our area, we have the 27 gauge needle, which works quite well with the sensor uh, uh, lens. Uh, I don't have any financial interest uh, from, uh, the, uh, from any, for, with any of the product, uh, products mentioned in this presentation or in this uh, session. But uh, if the surgeon doesn't have the uh, correct tools like the 30 gauge needle or the uh, lens with a polyvinyl LED haptic, so we can still use the three piece lens with PMMA haptics like the sensor lens of j and j and the 27 gauge needle works quite well. And only one micro forces is required compared to the glued IL, where our two micro forces are required for the handshake technique to externalize the haptics. Good, yeah. Um, you know, I, I personally think that uh, these are wonderful additions to our armamentarium, but uh, you know, the literature would still support that if you're properly sizing an anterior chamber IOL, uh, you properly place, all of these can have complications if they're improperly placed. Uh, the, you know, the literature would at least support that it's a, an alternative. And I think uh, the most important thing is, you know, you have to look at each situation. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Sashtev, is there an ideal situation for learning these cases? I assume you've just, uh, you know, had a capsule rupture, maybe the nucleus has descended, you're doing a vitrectomy. That's probably not the best time to learn uh, one of these scleral fixation techniques. Yeah, so uh, just to uh, uh, answer your question, the earlier one that you asked Dr. Asaf, I fully agree with you and that a Kelman multiflex uh, lens as also an iris clip lens are good techniques if a person is not comfortable uh, in doing uh, the Yamane or the glued IOL. Now for uh, answering your this particular question, yes, uh, when you are having a complication of the table, normally that is the time when you are, your adrenaline is there and you are uh, nervous as to what's going to happen and you have to remove the nucleus, et cetera. So that is not the best time that you should learn that. So actually, if you have a secondary of achia that you have, if a person has not had an implant earlier or for some reason, uh, uh, that would be a case where you would wish to do, or if there is a, a decentration of the IOL that is happening and you have to have a, you don't have a capsule like the conditions that uh, Kathy showed under those circumstances where you have to fix it. I think those are the conditions, but a good vitrectomy is something that is required for any of these, whether it is the Kelman multiplex, whether it is the iris clip or whether it is the Yamanese or whether it is the glued IOL technique. Uh, regarding what Dr. Asaf has said, yes, at times, if you are doing a handshake technique, you could require two microforces, but that's hardly a deal. So to everyone, it's the same. Uh, I don't love having uh, a non-covered uh, haptic uh, outside or uh, like in the Yamanese technique, a, a Shariat tunnel would again be preferred even if you don't want to use glue. So uh, those are a couple of my thoughts on the whole thing. 
Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have to uh, move on. I'm going <clears> to <throat> speak next, and we're going to now talk about the FACO itself. And these are uh, quickly some of my best pearls, no financial interest in any device. So as we said, you know, we have two goals here with sort of exfoliation. We have to preserve the bag uh, during surgically, but we then have to think about how we're going to avoid late bag IOL dislocation. Uh, and this is the situation we are, want to avoid where uh, seven years later, this entire uh, lens uh, has uh, dislocated and uh, we have no suturing options. The challenges are we'll frequently have a small pupil. With the lack of peripheral anchoring of the lens, it's harder to control the CCC as well as to rotate the nucleus. It's very easy to break those fragile zonules such as with rotation of the uh, lens. And when the posterior capsule is not taut, it tends to fly up toward our phaco tip. So my pearls are, uh, by all means, do whatever is necessary to complete your capsule orexis, even if you make it on the small side because you can enlarge it later. But having orexis allows you to use capsule retractors, which are preferable to iris hooks because of their length. Remember to reinflate the bag when you're dealing with the last piece or even with the cortex with a dispersive viscoelastic. Think about bimanual INA, which helps you to better control the position of the port so you don't aspirate the capsule. Wait to put the CTR in, hopefully until after the cortex is removed so you don't trap it. And think about the option of a three-piece lens in the sulcus. So that's what I'm gonna demonstrate. Now this is pseudo-elasticity. Look at the peripheral capsule. When I'm trying to pull the flap, the whole peripheral capsule moves, that's abnormal. And it's as though it's elastic, but what's really happening is we don't have zonular tension anchoring it. And that's what makes it hard to control it. So I'm using Brian Little's capsule tear out rescue technique right here to uh, uh, keep this from veering peripherally. Uh, and then we finally complete the rexus. So that is why the CCC is so hard. And that's why it helps to make it a little on the small side. Uh, but then once you've made it small, you can go back here and secondarily enlarge it. We've all seen capsule of phimosis like this, and that's an indication of severe zonulopathy. Uh, what it tells me, so I make it a little oblique cut and then I re-tear it, and uh, I can go literally out to the edge on these cases because I want, uh, I think of the capsule rexus as a sphincter. These cases on the right tell me that if it wasn't for the zonules resisting that contracture, every one of these capsulorexes should constrict. Uh, so it's important when you know you have potential zonulopathy, both progressive or present already, to make a generous diameter. And that's going to reduce the sphincter-like effect or contraction when you don't have the normal centrifugal pull. And uh, with severe zonulopathy, I actually try to go out to the edge of the optic uh, now, you don't have to worry too much if it veers out peripherally. Uh, you, you've already got the lens in place. Uh, but another alternative would just be to make little cuts radially in the capsule or excess margin like you would with a pupillary sphincterotomy just to prevent the effective contraction uh, in these cases. But this is what allows me to make the rexus small if I need to to control it but I don't want to leave it small uh, for sure. Now here, look at the, the, the reflex as I go in. It looks like I have a dull needle, but what it, what it really means is my peripheral, and my peripheral stretch on the anterior capsule is deficient, so the capsule is not taut. And so this is a time to use a CTR at the end. Notice I point the injector way to the left, so as the CTR opens to my right, it doesn't decenter things. And I like putting in a three-piece acrylic uh, IOL versus a one-piece if it's a monofocal. Now, here's a case where I caused a zonular dialysis with my INA. I grabbed the capsule without realizing and I stripped it. So I've got a dialysis. So I'm thinking maybe I'll put in a CTR, but look what happens here. I've got tremendous loss of zonules all over. And I don't think I caused all of that. This is a case with severe circumferential zonulopathy. And look at what happens now. I can't get the cortex out. And when I pull on it, 
the entire capsular bag is moving because those forces are transmitted by the CTR to the all 12 clock hours of the zonules. So I've created a mess here by putting in a CTR when I didn't really have good zonular support. So this is a, 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 a case to show you what happens when you have too much uh, lack of zonular support. What I really need is capsule retractors. And that's what I'm showing here. These are from the US company, Microsurgical Technologies. This is my modification. It's uh, a little bit shorter and it has a closed loop, but these are inserted like iris retractors, but they have a much longer length. So they're supporting the bag peripherally uh, as though you had artificial zonules. They're anchoring the capsule bag to the sclera, to the limbus, and so I do this before I rotate the lens when I know I've got severe zonulopathy. It's gonna support the <clears throat> bag in the AP direction when I do my FACO, and it's going to restrain the uh, tendency for the entire bag to be sucked into the FACO tip by holding it peripherally. I like doing chop, uh, especially horizontal chop, because I'm really not asking the zonules in the capsular bag to fixate the nucleus for sculpting. And I'm actually anchoring the nucleus with the phaco tip and chopping toward that with this uh, horizontal chop. And I will leave these in uh, until I'm, I've actually got the cortex out, uh, but they have the advantage, unlike the CTR, of supporting the bag without trapping the cortex. Uh, now, here's a, a pearl. I'm protecting my phaco tip with the chopper. But even in spite of that, right there, I aspirate uh, the posterior capsule. And this has caused this little, this rent uh, right here in the center. So what I needed to do is recognize that even though I've got just one piece remaining, that capsular bag is floppy. It's not taut because there's not enough pull peripherally from the zonules. So I use a dispersive viscoelastic that is going to stay where I put it. And I'm not just sort of pushing the capsule back, I'm filling the capsular bag so that it's on stretch. And once it's on stretch, it won't jump up to the phaco tip and it's just much safer. And that's what I needed to do. Same thing here, I've got my capsule retractors, but rather than uh, pulling that little piece out, I recognize this is one of the more dangerous situations where the posterior capsule will wanna follow it. So I push it back and put it on stretch with a dispersive. You can see how it stays there. Now, I don't have a CTR, but look at how the posterior capsule wants to follow the cortex right into the tip because it doesn't have enough uh, peripheral fixation from zonules. So this again is a very scary situation in terms of aspirating the posterior capsule. So the trick is to stop and look what happens. I fill the bag with a dispersive. It's going to resist aspiration and it gives counter fixation to the capsule, allowing me to strip the cortex away from it. Uh, 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 and then I put in my CTR uh, so that I haven't trapped any cortex uh, to support things. Now, this is a case where I put the lens in the bag and at the completion, I have pseudophacodenesis. Wow, do you see the bleb here? diffuse zonulopathy. So what I decided to do, I couldn't leave it there, I decided let's bring this lens back into the anterior chamber and then reintroduce one haptic at a time into the ciliary sulcus. And so uh, it's hard to do this with the posterior angulation of the haptic without first bringing it forward into the anterior chamber. And then you'll see one at a time, I guide this under the iris, but in front of the uh, capsule so it doesn't go into the bag. And I'll be left with haptic fixation, uh, uh, to, uh, sulcus fixation of, the, uh, of each haptic. Now look what happens. Once I've done that, I jiggle the eye and it does not move. So even though I'm not presenting a, a long follow-up with multiple 100 lenses, I'm showing you the same eye, the same lens. The only difference is once it was in the bag and then later it was in the sulcus. And it's telling me that in the sulcus, I get two point fixation in addition to my zonules uh, to support it. Um, now look at how the CTR is bending here. It's not going smoothly and I have a zonular dialysis. And so I've got to stop and refill the capsular bag number one 
so there's no folds. But I just have to be really careful that I don't force it or I'll puncture through. And here's one technique where you can kind of bend the CTR with a second instrument through the eyelet, and that helps me to uh, place it uh, there. So I wait until the CTR is in, then I pull out my capsule retractors. Remember, they're stabilizing the bag against the decentering force of the CTR as it's inserted. But I now have this large zonular dialysis. So remembering that last case, I'm gonna put a three-piece acrylic lens. I'm gonna put it in the sulcus. Now, the problem with the sulcus uh, potentially is this lens could rotate and go through the nasal zonular dialysis. So I orient the haptics away, 90 degrees away, superior inferiorly, uh, and then I'm going to capture the optic, first removing some of that viscoelastic that's in the bag so I don't trap it there. And then I buttonhole the optic through the CCC. So now we have optic capture, and this will prevent it from uh, rotating. It'll also prevent the rexus from contracting, and it'll give me good centration. Uh, so, and I don't have to adjust the power. So uh, these were the pearls, uh, and I would particularly uh, consider uh, using focus uh, fixation of a three-piece lens as an underutilized uh, technique. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, we'll ask for uh, Dr. Asaf's uh, presentation, and then we'll save any remaining discussion to the end. Uh, uh, Dr. Asaf uh, 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 is uh, one of the leading uh, surgeons in, in the Middle East uh, and uh, is at, in Cairo in Egypt. And he is gonna talk about uh, pearls for zonular dialysis, which we often see with trauma. So please play his uh, presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm here to talk to you about the FACO pearls for zonular dialysis. Zonular dialysis means deficiency of the zonular support of the lens capsule and can be caused by trauma or iatrogenic, maybe pronescent cataract, pseudoxfoliation syndrome, retinitis pigmentosa, or other syndromes like Marfan syndrome. It can be stratified according to the degree of zonular dialysis into mild, moderate, and severe cases of zonular dialysis. Detection of mild zonular dialysis preoperatively sometimes is challenging, but we can suspect mild zonular dialysis in the presence of subluxation of the other eye, history of trauma, history of complicated cataract surgery in the other eye, previous filtering or posterior segment surgery, presence of tremulous iris, or other clinical manifestations like Marfan syndrome. Or we can suspect as well mild zonulopathy in, in during biometry if there is a shallow anterior chamber in the presence of relatively long axial lens of the eye because the weak zonule allows the lens to move forward, causing shallowing of the anterior chamber during biometry. However, in many cases, mild zonular dialysis can be, can be present as an intraoperative surprise. Uh, as you can see, during initiation of the rexes, we find difficulty in puncturing the anterior capsule due to the weak tension on the anterior capsule by the weak zonules. And those capsular stria or capsular folds are one of the signs for the uh, mild uh, to moderate zonular dialysis. Another uh, sign we can detect mild zonular dialysis if there is uh, a, we a black or uh, red crescent uh, denoting focal area of zonular weakness intraoperatively. What are the burdens of the uh, zonular dialysis during phaco emulsification? First, we have a compromised stability of the anterior chamber due to weak, elastic, or absent zonular. So there is a turbulence in the anterior chamber because of the, so those weak zonules. That's why we need a device to fix the lens capsule in the y-axis during phaco emulsification. And after phaco emulsification, we would get a redundant lens capsule due to unequal tension on the lens equator, lens capsule equator. So we need another device to be inserted inside the lens capsule to redistribute the tension across the equator of the lens so we can get a centered lens capsule and centered IOL implantation. So the surgical tools for zonular dialysis include uh, the capsular support system and the equator support system. The capsular support system includes the capsular hooks or retractors or iris hooks or retractors. And for the uh, capsular supporting system, 
uh, actuator supporting system, we need the capsule attention ring or sometimes the capsule attention segments or known as Ahmed segment. For the capsule support system that can be named as artificial zoniers, we need to uh, secure with this device it uh, we can secure the lens capsule uh, in place to the sclera uh, it should be inserted as soon as uh, zonulopathy is detected prior to phaco emulsification to hold the lens capsule uh, in place um, during phaco emulsification we have here the standard hooks i like the chime modification for those hooks because it has a small distal end and shorter arms and prevent entanglement of the hoop with the capsule tension ring and they are easier for insertion as you can see in the movie and if those capsule uh, uh, supporting system or capsule hooks are not available we can use the iris hooks uh, the iris hooks are not designed for the uh, to hold the lens capsule in place uh, that's why it should be used cautiously because it um, causes localized contact with the lens capsule and pull the lens capsule forward the incision and it might tear the anterior edge of the lens capsule and complicate the surgery. So it be, should be used with caution. On the other hand, we have the equator support system and the function is to redistribute the tension across the 360 degrees of the equator of the lens capsule. It should be inserted as soon as it's required but should be delayed at the same time as soon as late as possible. Ideally, it should be inserted after cortical cleanup prior to implantation of the IOL device. We have the standard capsule tension ring that is indicated for mild cases of uh, zonier dialysis. And we have the Henderson modification with eight indentations uh, that uh, can be inserted prior to cortical cleanup. And we have the Sione modification with an eyelet to fix the capsule tension ring to the sclera in cases of moderate to severe zonier uh, dialysis. And uh, we have the uh, um, uh, Sione modification and as well as Malugan modification with the same eyelid but have been moved forward for the distal end of the uh, capsule tension ring so can be implanted through an injector system. And finally, we have the capsule tension segment or Ahmed segment that can be used uh, in conjunction with the uh, capsule tension ring or uh, just alone in cases of focal um, weakness or focal zonular dialysis. As you can see in this case, it's easier to be inserted and can be inserted anytime once the zonulopathy is detected and can provide a focal support for the lens capsule in, in some cases of uh, focal zonular dialysis. What about the intraoperative considerations of zonular dialysis? First, initiation of the rexis. Initiation of rexis might be difficult due because difficult in the puncturing of the anterior lens capsule. So we might need to use sharp instruments like MVR or keratome, or maybe we can use a needle. Sometimes in cases of massive zonular dialysis, we might use two needles in cross sort fashion in cases of massive zonulopathy to puncture the anterior capsule. During rexis formation, the, the tear of the anterior capsule might be misdirected, especially in the area of the zonulopathy, uh, because of the unequal tension across the lens equator and the anterior lens capsule. So we need to inject OVD every now and then to build tension on the anterior lens capsule. Sometimes we might need another instrument, second instrument, to anchor the lens and create a counter traction while creating the capsule rex, especially at the area of the zonular dialysis. And uh, maybe capsular hooks sometimes can be placed to create the counter traction in cases of massive zonular dialysis. As you can see in this case, we can place uh, one capsular hook or two capsular hook, and then we can continue rexis formation, especially at the area of the massive zonular dialysis. Uh, in cases of traumatic zonular dialysis, it's better to stain the anterior chamber with diluted triamcinolone acetate to see if there is any vitreous has been prolapsed inside the anterior chamber due to uh, trauma or not. So it's mandatory to do with vitrectomy prior to phaco emulsification or prior to uh, capsular excess initiation. So it's very important, especially in traumatic cases, to stain the vitreous with diluted triamcinolone acetate. It's mandatory to prevent anterior chamber collapse 
uh, during switching the instruments. And you can see here, just before removing the faculty from inside the anterior chamber, it's mandatory to uh, fill the anterior chamber and the lens capsule with cohesive OVD uh, before pulling out the faculty outside the anterior chamber. And uh, even during switching the instruments, like the irrigation aspiration instruments, it's mandatory to inject every now and then OVD before switching the instruments between the right and the left hands. Uh, another clue uh, that I have learned from David Chang that we can, in some selected cases of mild zonulopathy, we can use the three-piece IOL in the sulcus in the presence of standard capsule tension ring or without the capsule tension ring. So in those cases of mild zonular dialysis, we can just manage those cases by implantation of a three-piece IOL in the sulcus. And after implantation of the three-piece IOL in the sulcus, we can do the optic capture so we can get a decent centration of the lens capsule and the lens ca and, and the IOL optic. So in this case, as you can see, the lens has been placed inside the anterior chamber and then the capsular hooks is being removed and then with the coglin hook or uh, Sinuski hook we can place each haptic at a time into the sulcus and then we can do the optic capture of the uh, IOL or the three-piece IOL and this way we can get a decent centration of the lens uh, 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 lens optic and the lens would be pretty stable inside the sulcus after in the early and late post-operative period. And finally, sometimes in cases of massive zonular dialysis, we have to discard the lens capsule in total and we can implant the IOL and uh, fix the IOL either to the sclera uh, or we can fix the IOL to the iris. As you can see with 10 oproline suture, we can use as well the uh, iris claw lens to fix uh, this uh, lens to the uh, uh, iris, or we can fix the three-piece IOL to the sclera with the one of those intrascleral haptic fixation device technique. As you can see in these cases, I have an, uh, removed the whole lens capsule and then we can implant uh, iris claw lens either in the anterior chamber or posterior chamber uh, after eversion of the lens. I prefer to implant it in the posterior chamber after eversion of the lens and you can see that we can get a rounded pupil at the end of the surgery and in the other cases with a massive zonular dialysis we can remove the lens capsule uh, in total and here we can fix the IOL with the intrascleral haptic fixation technique either with the glued IOL technique or Riemannian technique that uh, will be covered later on by the uh, upcoming presentations. So my take home message that both capsular hooks and rings are essential for phacomulsification with zonular dialysis. Capsular hooks should be inserted as soon as possible while the capsule tension ring should be delayed as possible, mild zonular dialysis can be managed by capsule tension ring with a three-piece IOL or just three-piece IOL in the sulcus with optic capture. Moderate to severe cases of zonular dialysis should be managed with capsule tension ring with Ahmed segment or modified capsule tension ring with an eyelet to fix the, uh, the capsule tension ring to the sclera. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Well, great. Well, uh, that was a beautiful presentation. I think we covered uh, an awful lot uh, there. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left. You know, we haven't really talked about um, uh, premium IOLs, refractive IOLs. You know, these patients, they, they are like all, every other patient. They're interested in reducing their dependence on glasses. So, my Paul, what is your uh, kind of... Uh, thought process when a patient wants to be more spectacle independent, but let's say they have either some zonulopathy that you've noticed during surgery, maybe you put a CTR, or maybe they just have pseudoexfoliation and, and we have to be concerned later on about uh, subluxation decentration. So David, I normally tend to be a little more conservative rather than doing any harm to the patient because even if you have uh, post-operatively uh, a dislocation or even if you have a decentration or you have a capsular phimosis, which is uh, pretty often seen in these cases, so there will be a problem and the patients will have more of the dysphotopsias and the glare and the halos. 
so uh, it is uh, obviously challenging that uh, uh, you have to have a bang on center lens and the forgiveness that you have in these premium intraocular lenses is less until of course you are sure that you are going to have the whole thing very secure and there isn't going to be any increase in the decentration or the movement of the lens in the post operative period i would rather avoid because you don't get these kind of good premium lenses in three piece lenses right uh, and in several of these uh, situations you have to if it's a very mild zonulopathy which has happened during the surgery and you know that your ctr or your segment is going to control it and it's not going to be progressive then maybe you can go ahead and do that but uh, uh, do no harm is the dictum that i would uh, i would go to whether it's a toric lens which gets uh, de um, uh, rotated and then it uh, causes uh, a negative effect or you get a lot of dysphotopsias and patient being discomforted for that so i tend to be a little more conservative with the premium iuls in zonopathy right uh, ahmed yes i agree uh, 100% uh, and, uh, I tend to avoid premium lenses in cases of progressive zonulopathy because we are not sure how much how, for how long this uh, lens will be stable with the lens capsule complex will be stable in the near future. But some cases of traumatic cataract, we might, because the zonulopathy here in this situation is pretty stable. So if we can um, guarantee the stability of the lens and centration of the lens, I might think of either of lens. They are less forgiving compared to the premium lenses like the trifocal lens. So maybe we have a chance for the new generation of either of lens that might be more forgiving in terms of the centration or sometimes the biometry. So I, I might give a second, a second thought with the of lens in the presence of traumatic cases only, but progressive zonulopathy, I tend to avoid premium lenses as previously mentioned. Yeah, no, great. Uh, no, and I think it depends on the patient, depends on their age. It depends though also on what you find at surgery. So sometimes you may go in with the plan, maybe for a toric monofocal, and we tell the patient, but if I find that, you know, your capsule is not as stable, we may not be able to do that. We just showed doing a three piece in the sulcus, of course, as an example. Um, I'm not, I, I guess our, we're, uh, our time is up. I don't know if there's another session to follow, uh, but do you, uh, you know, one thing I have uh, found is, uh, you know, I'm impressed more and more with how often eye rubbing, you know, just contributes to instability. And it's made me start with pseudoexfoliation patients to particularly caution them about rubbing their eyes after surgery. And uh, is that something that either of you uh, have found or, or think is worth doing? Uh, for me, I haven't. Uh notice that I have in mind affect the zone your stability, but I think I, I should look for this. <laughs> no, I think uh, eye rubbing, forceful eye rubbing and uh, the zonules being uh, loose all over, uh, you can actually see the movement. You're showing it very well in the interop situation. You can do that. And I think keratoconus and loose zonules are two things where we definitely tell the patient not to rub the eyes. Yeah, very good. Uh, I, need, well, uh, I need to comment on the toric lenses in, in, in presence of the uh, zonulopathy or traumatic uh, zonulysis. Um, as you know, the toric lenses are present in a single piece format. So I have some cases that I can provide some spectacle independence for distance, at least in case, especially cases of uh, large amount of corneal astigmatism. Just after doing the CTR and fix the capsule to the sclera or the, just place the CTR or Ahmed segment, then I can place the IOL inside the bag and rotate the lens toward the implantation axis. And then we can pop out, do the, what's known as the reverse of the capture. Uh, uh, with the IOL, of course, we should have a rexes around five millimeter, not more, or 5.5 millimeter, not more, to have a successful reverse of the capture. And this way, the lens won't rotate uh, um, after uh, implantation in these cases, specific, specific cases of mild uh, zonia dials due to trauma, of course, not because of progressive zonia. I need to uh, hear your comments. I am a little more liberal in doing a top-up refractive surgery. 
So in case a patient is very demanding and uh, I feel that uh, the lens is not going to be stable in a toric form, I'll go in for a normal uh, spherical lens and top it up later at three months interval uh, uh, with a laser refractive correction and that works very well. Uh, residual refractive errors, residual cylinders do exceptionally well. The other day, a 79 year old person uh, who had an ECC with a minus six cylinder, uh, I just did a laser refractive and he said, why the hell I wasn't told to get it done 20 years ago when I had this process done. And he is really thrilled. So I don't think uh, uh, we should underestimate the power of uh, the corneal procedures that can take care of uh, toricity and residual refractive error in such surprises. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think our time is up. I want to thank all of our speakers for just uh, outstanding presentations. I think in one hour's time, we gave the audience a, a whole lot of pearls uh, for this very these very, very challenging uh, patients and eyes. So uh, with that, I'm going to conclude the session and uh, we'll uh, ask everyone to return for the, uh, the next sessions coming up. Thank you again. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Asaf and Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Pleasure to be with you.